Welcome to Heaven and Earth. I'm Wyatt Graham, and I'm joined with David Haynes. And David is a fellow Canadian, and I didn't really, we've never really met before this, but we don't live that far apart, and we have a number of people in common, so it's kind of fun to be able to talk to you for a little bit. David, can you just briefly introduce, like, who you are? Because I'm not sure everybody listening will know who you are. I didn't even, <laughs> in terms of recently, so. Hey, so um, who I am, that's a, that's a deep question. Uh, so you, on my Facebook, I just say that I'm a, I'm a reformed theologian and atomistic philosopher uh, from Canada. Uh, and I think that fairly that gives a decent summary of who I am. I mean, I, I did my bachelor's in theology and biblical studies, and then I went on my master's and doctorate were both in philosophy. Uh, and uh, what, probably the, one of the biggest subjects that I've been stuttering, studying since, uh, I don't know, maybe 2000 and, 10, 2009, it's been the, the primary concent, uh, concentration of almost everything I've been looking at. It has been uh, how uh, the church throughout history has studied natural theology, has looked at God and the relationship between God and, and nature, and then, you know, philosophy and theology. Those are the subjects that really interest me. Uh, it might be worth noting that uh, um, I teach online courses with uh, Veritas International University and, and the Davenant Hall. Uh, I've taught medieval philosophy at University of Sherbrooke. I uh, taught that this uh, this winter, actually. And um, looking to teach a couple of courses uh, with Davenant Hall and Veritas again this, this fall. I'm a father of four children. We have a small hobby farm with uh, chickens and quail and goats and rabbits. And um, let me see. I have, I have a lot of experience uh, pastoring and a lot of the ways in which I've approached a lot of the subjects in the past has been uh, with a pastoral emphasis. Uh, and, and so I've gotten a lot of use out of some of the, uh, some of the Puritans and how they will mm -hmm. take these really deep theological and philosophical subjects and then apply this to Christian life. It's interesting. Um, there's a couple of things. One, uh, you must be a millennial because you have a hobby farm. Uh, you probably eat avocado toast in the morning. I, I'm just guessing. What kind of toast? Avocado. Actually, no. I, I'm I'm fairly standard. I two. I we have chickens. I okay. get farm fresh eggs every morning. Nice. I uh, we actually get uh, farm fresh eggs. I guess delivered to our house on Fridays. So, um, I I like it. I'm I'm open to that lifestyle. I would, you know what? Maybe I have to see. My wife would love it more than I would. I think. Um, it's fun and it's uh, you know honestly it's fun for the kids too uh, the I think kids that's have, a big deal yeah for kids yeah they have grown a lot uh, ha learning responsibility for example the the kids will be, have their their chores they take care of the animals mm -hmm. and uh, i usually will be the one that takes care of some of the, the the harder stuff some of the more difficult but for the most part they go out they feed the animals give them water and bring back the eggs and they're learning a whole lot uh learning to appreciate and this is the one thing I, I love about it they're learning to appreciate god's creation uh and, and uh how things how beautiful things are, how organized things are, and so on. I like that. Uh, the other thing you said uh, was that you are a reformed Thomist. Now, I know Thomas Aquinas, and he's a, he's a Roman Catholic, and you're reformed. So how can you be a Thomist if, you know, Aquinas is Roman Catholic? That's my question. And I'm asking it because I, I know the answer. I mean, I know how I think about it, but I think some people might hear a reformed Thomist. Those seem to be like you know, oil and water. Yeah. So what, what is a reformed Thomist and why would that actually be something that a reformed person could be and still be faithful to both scripture and to that tradition to what she or she is? Sure. Maybe I'd premise my response by saying it, uh, it, it's a label, right? So, I mean, a lot, I know a lot of people who don't like labels, you know, you ask them, Hey, are you an Augustinian? And they're just kind of like, yeah, I don't qualify my theology as anything. I just read the Bible. Um, and, that's fine. If, if someone wants to, to, to take that approach, that's great. But you know, when you apply a label to yourself and you say, hey, I'm this type of a theologian, I'm reformed. In my case, I'm reformed and I'm a Thomist. What that does is it provides kind of a shorthand for people to kind of rapidly grasp, okay, so he says he's reformed. That means he must adhere minimally to certain theological positions. He says he's Thomist. That means he must minimally adhere to certain doctrines of some sort, right? Now, what those are, that might be up for debate, 
but I try to answer that actually in my article in the book uh, that I edited without excuse where I, I kind of, I, I go through a lot of the Thomistic uh, writings from the early to mid 1900s. Uh, a lot of uh, Catholic Thomists were asking the question, what does it mean to be a Thomist? You know, following the, the uh, papal decree that Tom, Thomas was going to be the patron saint of universities and all of this stuff. And so it's, he's going to be some important influence on people. So if we're going to be Thomists, okay, what does that mean? And, and so you go through all of these guys, these guys and almost nobody agrees on anything. They, they, <laughs> the, they will agree on minimal points. And so I list them out in my chapter uh, where, where we talk about different elements in philosophy. In order to call yourself a Thomist, philosophically speaking, you've got to adhere minimally to a certain number of doctrines. You know, I'm, the ones that I think are the easiest to, cap, to kind of capture would be like, you know, a moderate realism when it comes to ontology and epistemology. Um, you might want to talk about hylomorphism when it comes to, uh, to the question of human nature. Uh, what, is, what is man composed of? And you might want to talk about, uh, you know, uh, natural law theory uh, and virtue ethics when it comes to moral philosophy. So, so those would be some broad lines in, in philosophy. And, uh, you know, in theology, that's where it kind of gets touchy because, you, can, you know, everyone thinks Thomas Aquinas and then and they think about the, you know, the, the Eucharist and, well, the, and different doctrines on Mary and so on and so forth, right? And that's clearly not Protestant. A Reformed theologian couldn't possibly take those doctrines, right? Okay, that, that's, that's great. So we've picked out about 1% of the theology of Aquinas and we've said, see, can't be a Thomist because of this 1%. Well, okay, let's leave that to one side now. Now let's go back to his act, his theology and, and work through it, the different doctrines. And what's interesting is when you work through the different doctrines, uh, and, and in fact, even amongst Catholic Thomists, uh, questions related to, for example, a specific doctrine in relationship to the Eucharist don't even come up. Uh, so they're going to talk about maybe uh, the exam, for example, and, and this is one of the examples that I give in my, in my chapter, uh, the, the importance of the scriptures in developing uh, doctrine and the relationship of the, uh, or the use of early and then medieval uh, church theologians in helping to develop doctrine. Also the, the, the use of uh, creeds and confessions in helping to develop doctrine. And, and so if we take that and we say, Aqu Aquinas had a certain approach to this. To, to be Thomist, you've got to have minimally that approach because that, that's kind of foundational for how you do your doctrine. Um, so what was Aquinas' approach? Um, scriptures are absolutely authoritative and inspired, period, full stop. Everything else for Aquinas is used only as probable authorities, including the great church fathers, such as Augustine. Uh, and so if, if you put it this way, Scriptures are first, they have the prime authority. Everything else is secondary. You say, well, that's not all that far from the reformed approach to the use of scripture and the, cre the creeds and the, and the church fathers in developing doctrine. And uh, in fact, that's one of the approaches, that's one of the ways in which reformed theologians were very similar to Aquinas in their theology. Other, other, other areas would be, we could also throw in theology proper, uh, and, uh, and in fact, uh, interestingly enough, I think it was J.V. Fesco uh, recently proposed uh, in, in a book on Aquinas among the Protestants that even some elements uh, in, in what Protestants would call sanctification, uh, which Aquinas would call justification, even some elements of that, there are Reformed theologians who would re agree with Aquinas on his approach to those, those questions. So, yeah, I think, that, I think what you said is so helpful. Um... I obviously, it was kind of a setup question. I think even just from a historical point of view, if you just think, okay, so who, who is the Reformed Church? Well, the Reformed Church is that large segment of Catholics who reformed according to word, according to the word and spirit. Yep. So we were, all of us are Catholics. We are the Reformed branch of Catholicism. That's what it is. Yep. yep. And uh, because of that, everybody that came before, you know, was it 15, 17 or 18? The, whatever, uh, 15, 15 17, 17. Is, um is our people. They may have been way off. <laughs> I'm not saying that they're all correct. And uh, then you have someone like Thomas Aquinas, where he might be 1% off where we are today. But I tell you, you should read Martin Luther. <laughs> You'll find him maybe 2% off. 
where you are today. And uh, you talked about justification at the end. Luther, in, in some cases, I think has three forms of justification. Uh, John Davenant obviously has infused, not obviously, but he has infused justification, then I think habitual justification. Sure. But the language we use today is, is specific, but it's part of one stream of reformed thought. Yeah. And I think it's fine. I mean, but it's fine to say justification, sanctification, et cetera, and I'm no problem with that. But we need to be open to theological judgments, meaning you're judging the whole idea, not necessarily the specific terms and how it all fits. I think when you come to Aquinas, you really can't judge him by 16th century standards of that particular scholastic debate on imputation and so on. Yeah, it just wasn't exactly. in his world. In fact, that whole question that you just brought up there, Charles Wraith, I think it's Charles Wraith III, wrote an interesting uh, book in which he compares Aquinas and Calvin in their commentaries on Romans. And one of the things that he points out is that, and he's not the only one who's pointed this out. I mean, this is, this kind of, uh, co- this kind of observation has start, has in, within the last maybe 50 years has become a standard point of truth type of thing. Like people are just, you know, this is an academic truth now that Aquinas and Calvin are essentially saying the same thing using different terms. Mm-hmm. And so if it, like you just said, if we're paying attention to what they're saying and not the specific term like okay so aquinas uses the word merit calvin doesn't like the word merit okay okay well, let's get rid of the, those words and look at the concepts they're using they actually end up saying very much the same thing uh, and uh, wraith i think actually points out that uh, some of the positions that uh, calvin critiques uh which are in the um commentaries on calvin's uh institutes are attributed to aquinas actually are not Aquinas's positions. In fact, Aquinas would hold the same thing as Calvin on those positions. And, and so what Wraith points out is that in, in some areas where people have seen uh, a, a problem between a Calvin and Aquinas, that problem was only put there because of people who, because of the editors of uh, Calvin's institutes, but it wasn't actually there between Calvin and Aquinas. They were saying the same thing. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And you know, re- I've been reading through Calvin's Institutes recently, and I, he- I think he mentions Thomas, and there'll be some stuff like that, but it- it's unclear that he's really read Thomas. I don't mean that in like a jab, I just mean that you don't read everything. And no. at that time, he-, he probably read, certainly though he read Tom- Thomas at that time. And the question is, do um, 16th, century- 16th century Thomas represent Thomas well? And that's another question to ask. It's not clear. I mean, some I'm sure do, some don't. Just like today, you can be a Calvinist today, but do you really represent Calvin? Yeah, exactly. Um, maybe not. So I think that's that's really helpful. And I think um, that kind of gets away some of the weeds. So you we can actually talk about the issues. I mean, we don't deify Thomas Aquinas as being um, as being someone who's inspired in terms of like scripture. He's right, he's wrong, just like John Calvin. But there are some things that are useful in him that I think could open up, our, open up our eyes to certain truths. And one thing you mentioned is um, it's in book one, question eight thereabouts, where he's really clear. Scripture alone, uh, not, he's, I don't know if he's the word, but scripture is what you use for dogma that's certain. Yep. Everything else is merely probable, whether that's authorities or whatever. And you read him like that, and it's just kind of, it's a bit refreshing. Like you don't think you're going to see something like that. And by the way... You occasionally find little quotes coming from Aquinas on, on that, which, which sometimes, you know, a Protestant might be included of, of, of picking a quote, but no, it is actually in context. He's, he's, he's right. really saying it. And, and he, he does say, for example, you know, I will believe the Pope uh, in so much as what he says agrees with the apostles and the prophets. In other words, as long, if the Pope agrees with scriptures, I agree 100% with the Pope. Right. Which, and I think any Protestant could adhere to that. And by the way, I think many medievals would have thought that too. It's not like this yeah. is, they were not, if you look at history, they were not uh, slavish to the Pope for sure. In fact, the Popes rarely ever had the kind of control that we might imagine at all. No, exactly. Um, yeah, and it was, so, and Aquinas, we should know too, uh, it was a Bible commentator and preacher. He was in the order of the Dominicans, right? So he would have been a preacher. Yes. And uh, I mean, I've read his commentaries on Ephesians and Galatians. If you read his Galatians commentary, um, you're not going to find too much to object to. Exactly. Uh, really? I so, mean, maybe nothing. You might say, like, I don't love this terminology, or he's a little bit unclear on how the 
you know, connection is, but he, he's, it's pretty certain that he saw life as flowing out of God's grace in all, yep. every way, shape, or form. That's actually a good point that you brought up. A lot of times when people think about Aquinas, they think about the Summa Theologia. And almost inherently, almost inevitably, the only thing they've read is the five ways, because you know that's about all that anyone thinks of that's important in Aquinas. But like you said, he was a member of the Dominicans, and he was a member of the Dominicans really early on, a couple, maybe, maybe 15 to 20 years after uh, it, was, it was started by St. Dominic. Okay? Uh, the Dominican movement in the early years, its expressed purpose was to bring the church at that period of time back to the lifestyle of the early apostles through the preaching of the word of God. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, I hear that and it just sounds to me like, man, these guys were reformed before it was cool to be reformed. Right. Well, yeah. Aquinas joins up very early and so he, one of the things that he's doing is trying to um, basically preach the word of God in the university setting. And his, his emphasis is going to be biblical interpretation. So yeah. if we're going to try and figure out who Aquinas is, our, you, know, you asked me earlier, who was David Haynes? Well, let's ask who Aquinas was. First things first, Aquinas was a biblical exegete. That was his primary We just had a technical glitch, but we're back now. So, David, you were saying uh, Aquinas is actually a preacher, part of the order of preachers. He was a kind of an early reform type person in that sense. And uh, it's important to realize that. So you want to kind of want to continue that point? Yeah, so he, he, was, uh, he was interpreting scriptures. And he, he, like you mentioned, some of his commentaries are, are, are quite good. I mean, uh, in the sense that um, you don't find anything in there that would be off key for the most part. You don't find anything that you just kind of, well, that's a weird interpretation. Um, in fact, even on some of the issues that are hi highly debated, he often takes kind of a, a middle road. Uh, the one that immediately comes to mind is um, the whole debate on Romans chapter seven. Who is the I in Romans chapter seven? You know, is it Paul as a, a mature Christian or is it uh, a, a, a non-Christian? Uh, Paul is a non-Christian speaking of his experience under the law and all of this. Well, Aquinas basically says, hey, there's, there's two views on this. We're going to read the passage um, under both views. And so he goes through Romans chapter 1, and in each section he says, well, if we're reading this as Paul as a mature Christian, this is how we would interpret the passage. If we're reading this as Paul as a non-Christian, this is how we would interpret the passage. And he's, he, he gives, uh, you know, in a, in a manner that should be very unsurprising, seeing as he was an Augustinian, he, he gives... Uh, more importance to Paul as a mature Christian. Uh, he thinks that's probably the best way to read it, but he doesn't get rid of the other idea completely and uses that in his interpretation. And it's fairly straightforward. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about his commentary is, is he's constantly quoting the scriptures all the time. In order to properly interpret the scripture, we also have to remember, and then he just goes through and quotes scripture. Mm. So, so sometimes you're reading his commentary and you're looking for some set of some sort of you know, out of this world insight, and all you're going to find is Aquinas is showing us that this scripture, how we should understand it in light of other scriptures. You know what's so helpful? Uh, so one thing you said, I'm kind of realizing as you're talking, is that what Aquinas does by showing those different views is actually what a lot of early Christian commentators has, have done. And there's a real sense of like humility in that they come to the text realizing there are legitimate differences but you, you often see this, like you can read it this way or this way, even perhaps this way. Yeah. And they're not really opposed or fighting each other. But there's just a real sense where like someone like Romans 7, no one's, no one's like proved that it's one. I mean, that's why you have so many views yeah. on it still. Is it a Christian, yeah. non-Christian? Is it Israel or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's incredibly helpful for us to think through. There's, there's a certain reverence uh, when they come to scripture. Yeah. Um, it, go on, sorry. Okay, you know, you could also just add in this one last thing about his interpretation of scripture. You know, he, he doesn't write a huge book on hermeneutics, right? But in uh, the first question of the Summa Theologia, he is going to ask how should we, you know, how do we interpret scriptures? And he will provide the, the typical uh, four levels of interpretation that yeah. you're going to find throughout the entire Middle Ages. 
but he says, and he's very clear on it. I mean, to the, to the point of he, repetition, he will say the literal interpretation is the ground level interpretation. The other four levels of interpretation are based upon the literal interpretation. So we start with literal interpretation. This is what the text means. After that, we can look for the other levels. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so he's, he's already pushing this, uh, this approach to literal interpretation, which uh, would, if, I, if my memory serves me well, would have been very much in line with the early Greek Cappadocian fathers uh, who were taking a more hard line on literal interpretation in reaction to origin. Not entirely rejecting origin, of course, but, but trying to, to kind of come in and what, you know, kind of level out the table a bit. Well, I, it's interesting when you come to Aquinas on the on literal interpretation. I, I think if I remember right, too, he, he's really emphasizing if you want to say what doctrine is, you really got to get it from the literal sense. Yep. Um, the moral sense is great for obviously moral, the anagogic, all that kind of stuff is great. Yep. But it's got to be the literal sense. And when you come to the Reformed uh, exegetes, there's a weird history, but they're not rejecting the fourfold categories as such. In fact, if you read the Puritans you will find much moral, much allegorical, and, and much eschatological, like whatever. Like you're going to find that everywhere. Yep. But um, I, I think there is a, a revaluation in the literal sense where that's the central sense upon which everything is tied. Yep. And I'd actually argue, if you read Origen, uh, his allegorical interpretation is always tied to the text. It's tied to something, well, always is too strong. It, it, I think he, he probably means it to be. You could argue that it's not. Uh, and it, <laughs> And I think what he's doing is something called like the, uh, the an analogy of scripture. It's the scripture interprets scripture. Yep. So what you see as allegory, he's reading the whole canon of scripture from the perspective of Christ and trying to adduce what something means in light of eschatology. Sure. Uh, and we often kind of read him as just making, like we assume that he's making things up. But act the more you know the Bible and the more you read origin, you realize that he's, he knows more Bible than you'll ever know. That's something, by the way, good. that I've discovered with in my readings of most of the early church fathers and the medieval theologians. Um, you, when you're reading these guys, you're, if you're paying attention and you're going to realize these guys are bathed in the scripture. They're not these theoretical thinkers out there trying to bring in Platonism or Aristotelianism and trying to, 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 to baptize it. No. They are bathed in scriptures. Their reference is scriptures. And like you said, they often know scriptures a whole lot better than we think we do. Mm -hmm. And by memory in a way that is, is pretty profound. So I think that's how, because we got, we got reformed Thomism kind of figured yeah. out. It's a thing. Uh, in fact, if you were formed in the 17th century in, in the city of Utrecht, you would be studying Thomas yeah. Aquinas' Summa for to be a reformed pastor and the reason is because of the things we said probably i'm not sure why they justified it but the reason is because he's congruent with reformed theology there might be the one percent but luther might have two percent actually when you think about the ubiquity of christ's body and so on um so that's kind of got that out of the way i think that's helpful to talk through um it's good to read a thomas if you want to his summa is helpful my understanding of it is that it's actually for kind of like seminary students to learn how to counsel or to do confession more accurately, but kind of what we think of that, as counseling. The, the, the funny thing that most people don't get is uh, in his prologue, he says, this is a book written for uh, beginner students in theology. Mm -hmm. So novices in theology. Mm -hmm. uh, and his purpose is to try and systematize the entire area of theology because up to that point, People are coming to theology and they've got their, their teachers just kind of throwing doctrines at them almost and debating fine topics and not getting into other topics. And, and so it's, it's very unorganized. And so he's trying to set some sort of order down to teach it. And, and so it's just the, the Summa Theologiae is really a, a good, um, you might say, course textbook. It's, it is a course of study. We're starting with this doctrine, the doctrine of God upon which everything else is based. And this might, this is actually very helpful for the, this entire conversation we're having. For Aquinas, everything based first and foremost on God. That's the starting point. What humans are, what the world is, 
uh, how to interpret scripture. All of these other questions are secondary to God. Uh, that's the starting point. No, I can see that. I think that's important. Um, he had a high view of scripture, but his, his sense of who God is, I think even the end of his life is fascinating. If that's a true tale that he kind of ends his life with sort of a, a precursor spiritual sight of God and kind of gets distraught and doesn't necessarily want to continue writing because of what he experienced, whether that's true or not, I have no idea, but that's kind of the story anyways. Um, so, okay, we have that. Um, I kind of want to pivot a little bit to talk about the topic of, well, this is your chapter is on reformed Thomism, I guess in this book, but on the book without excuse sure. that the Davenant Institute published, you edited the book. So there's a number of authors, but you're the editor and you contributed one chapter. Yep. There's one chapter. And uh, it's an inter- I haven't finished it yet. I read your chapter and some other things. Um, uh, the topics are scripture, reason, and presuppositional apologetics, as the subtitle says. That's pretty broad, I mean, but it is kind of important thing. So I can, scripture is, you know, Bible. Reason, I think kind of you might be having natural theology, natural law, natural knowledge kind of there. And presuppos- presuppositional apologetics is kind of associated with Cornelius Van Til. So we don't have to talk about all of those things, but... Um, it might be useful just to say like from your perspective kind of like if you're just talking to someone what's natural theology law knowledge what are those things what are the, what do those words signify sure uh, maybe i'll start with natural knowledge that's i think the easiest one to understand and then the others would maybe be subgroups of that yeah so natural knowledge it's it's really straightforward it's it's this idea that hey i can i have knowledge or able to have knowledge of the natural world. Uh, I actually um, published an article with um, David Institute in which I talk about um, natural knowledge and biblical interpretation. Uh, that was a couple of years ago. And just talked about the importance of natural knowledge for biblical interpretation. In other words, uh, you cannot properly interpret scriptures without a minimum of natural knowledge. Now, what are we talking about here? Uh, the idea is, um, what is a lamb? You know, what, what is a lamb? You know, I, earlier I was talking about, you know, we have, we have goats out here, right? Well, there's this parable that Jesus talks about. At the, end of the, at the end of time, God's going to separate out the lambs from the goats. Well, that's all well and good. That's a great story. But if you don't know what a lamb and a goat is, that means absolutely nothing to you. You know, or, or you know, Solomon, go to the ant thou sluggard and, and learn from their ways and be wise. Thank you, Solomon. What's an ant? You know, you need a certain amount of knowledge about the natural world in order to properly interpret scriptures. And that's what we mean when we talk about natural knowledge. We're just talking about things that uh, humans come to knowledge of naturally, you might say. And about what? About the cosmos. So natural knowledge could include things such as geography, biology, zoology, uh, I mean, it can it conclude the learning of a language. Uh, I would suggest, uh, as would many philosophers, that uh, having at least a language is natural to human beings. That's to, to be a human being. One of the things that would be included in there is to to have a language, to be able to express oneself uh, with 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 some sort form of communication, uh, words, and so on. So we we it's not something you might say. You might put it this way: um, natural knowledge is all of those forms of knowledge, everything that you can possibly know, which is other than that, which is divinely revealed in scripture. You, you might put it like that. I can't hear you. I think I lost your uh, sound, I guess. Sorry, I had it hit my there mute button there. <clears throat> I think that's incredibly helpful, especially how you kind of simplified it. Um, I've kind of thought about this too, maybe not at the same level you have, but when you come to the Bible, for example, before you even read it for the first time, you have, uh, you've grown up, you've learned grammar, even if you don't know these in detail, grammar, syntax, literature, logic, sequence, motion, geography, what is a Jerusalem? What is a city? What is a boat? I mean, if you think of a schooner, a boat in Israel is not a schooner. No, um, exactly. As far as I know, I don't think, no, I don't think they did. Uh, so Jonah is, is in, a, in a boat. What is that boat? It's not our boat. So to, before you even come to scripture, you have a number of notions and concepts yep. and skills that are prerequisite to even approaching yep. the reading of the Bible. 
And therefore, uh, and then exactly. by the way, when you read the Bible, um, you're reading a translation that derives Five. from about a thousand people who have done historical, like on just every word, by the way, that you read in the Bible comes from a technical dictionary that builds on like a thousand, I don't know the number, like a thousand people who have done detailed sociological, text critical, archaeological, uh, I can't even think about like many other kind of things. You've studied Potter, all these kinds of things. Then they've come and said, this word in the book of Jonah from whatever it is, say 3000 years ago, likely is close to the meaning of this English gloss ish. Yep. Exactly. And then it's translated into English. And then beyond that translation, those words are organized in English to communicate the larger sense of a sentence. And sometimes they have to be kind of tweaked to fit into English. Yeah, so the, absolutely. Whole, so the whole process of approaching scripture assumes and requires a massive amount of natural knowledge on your part as the reader, but yeah. also on the creation of the text in front of you. And by creation, I just mean the, the translation, the, the page and all that kind of stuff. Um, absolutely. Now, I wouldn't want to, I want to put in a, a quick qualification there. You are dead on. It, it's a massive amount of natural knowledge that you need to need to read scriptures. However, I would also say I would also suggest that a good portion of that natural knowledge that you need, you probably have already obtained it uh, by I don't I, I don't want to say you know sixth grade or anything, but through your elementary and secondary education, you are obtaining a great deal of natural mm. knowledge sufficient that by the time you've finished even elementary school in a, you know in an english area for example so you're finishing up to grade eight you probably have enough natural knowledge to be able to read the scriptures and understand them on a basic level you might, you might not catch some of the nuances you know that's the whole point of biblical commentaries i mean there are nuances on nuances on nuances and commentators are spending their entire lives studying a couple books of the bible because they're so deep and every time you come back to them you're discovering new depths I mean, the, the scriptures are amazing at that level. But there's also the fact that by, by the time you've lived a certain amount of life, you've gained a certain amount of experience in the natural world. You've learned a language, maybe through your parents helping you, uh, maybe through school, uh, public school or private, whatever. You've learned the basics of language. And along with the basics of language, you've learned a little bit of logic, uh, nothing formalized, but you know, sufficient to be able to read a text. And so... You know, you're, you're going through elementary school and you've got this just massive amount of natural knowledge being pounded into your head through your own experience, through your education, allowing you to be able to read those scriptures. But think, we don't think about that when we sit down to read the Bible. Yeah, thanks for saying that because you're right. I mean, the way I made it sound was like you need to know this massive amount, but, but natural knowledge is, is not, it's what everyone can get yeah. <laughs> who has a, has a regular capacity. It's what you get as a child. It's not like this magical elitist thing. It's the basics of reality. And when he said logic, I mean, that could be as simple as when a, a, when a word says he went to a city, that actually represents a city that's in reality. Like that's logic, right? I'm not, it's not meant to be this complex, you know, like with tables of, of, of you know, logic, like you can see in philosophy classes and so on. Yeah. Okay, that's entirely helpful. Uh, so the natural law and theology probably gonna make sense in light of this, but maybe I can let you define them. Right, exactly. And so that's, once you've got this idea of, okay, this is natural knowledge. But once you've got that, natural theology and natural law would be subsets of natural knowledge. That, at least that is how Christian theology, and I would even say, uh, you know, early uh, Greek, Plato and Aristotle, and then and some of the, the, some of the, uh, er, the Neoplatonists, like Plotinus, for example, or Proclus, they are, they're seeing stuff like this knowledge of natural what we would call natural natural theology or natural law it's seen as a subset subset of natural knowledge that is there are certain truths about god that can be known through our relatively simple observations of nature and when i say nature here in this in, in this sentence uh, what i mean is the cosmos which would include of course yourself okay, and human beings in general, and even the flow of human history. So that, that's the idea, is that there's, there are these certain truths about God, which can be known naturally. We, we, that is, we know them through our natural faculty of reasoning, through observation of the cosmos and its history. 
And that is uh, basically what all we're saying is that there are some things, one of the sub brackets of natural knowledge is God. Now, it's important, and it, it, you know, it's important to make distinctions. It's important to make nuances. And, and so it's important to add in here that when we're saying there are some truths about God that you can know naturally, we're not saying that by this knowledge, you come to a saving knowledge of God. What we're saying is there are some minimal truths. And what the Reformed theologians have consistently said is that these minimal truths are sufficient, and again, they're basing it on Romans chapter 1, 19 and 20, these minimal truths are sufficient for man to know that God exists, something of the divine nature. We're not saying that he knows everything, okay? That would be really simple to, to demonstrate this, the falsity of the claim that you can know everything about the divine nature, okay? But it's a lot more difficult to show that it's impossible to know something of the divine nature. If you can know that God exists, you know something about the divine nature. And the Reformed theologians often said, this knowledge you have is sufficient to know that you should worship him, that he will judge human actions, and therefore, conclusion, those who do not worship him and those who do not live up to moral standards, that which would, be, by the way, be natural law, and I'll come back to that, those who don't live up to those standards are therefore, you know, the title of our book, without excuse. They're without excuse because, you know, if I could borrow something from Calvin, the easiest way to know something about God is to go outside and observe his creation. So that's, that's the easiest way to get in contact with God, says Calvin. Mm. Um, it might be helpful, too, to mention, I believe it's a second article in the Belgic Confession. Uh, notes that there are, there are two books. There's the book of nature, which we can mm -hmm. see all these things, and then the book of scripture. And the distinction there is that the book of scripture is much more clear. And so Romans 1, I think 20 or 9, I think it's 20. Yeah, yeah we can, it, Paul says we can clearly perceive uh, through the things that are made God's nature that exists and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, we can see that, but we can't really peer deeper into that. We're not going to come up with the Trinity, for example. No, exactly. Or we're going to come up with a cross just because we saw a tree once. Um, so there are some things you can see, but it, it's sufficient to make you without excuse. But yeah. it's not sufficient necessarily to kind of bring you to salvation in Christ Jesus. That's what scripture is. That's what yeah. preaching is. Right. That's right. Um, and so it's a helpful way to think about it. And um I think once, once you kind of put it out there, it makes sense. I mean, if I'm a person, I go to my doctor, I trust him or her. If they're going to operate on my knee or my arm, I trust that they have enough natural knowledge in medicine and enough natural urge to do what is right to uh, fix my arm, to do surgery on me. Yep. Because I don't think that their brain is, because of sin, so mouth and mind malformed they can't learn medicine or arts or science right. or government and the same thing's true for like some very basic things about natural law like you can see how the world works what's true and it's right yep. um everyone kind of knows murder is wrong even if you still do it yeah um everyone knows that pretty much everyone admits that a divine being exists but they may not know who it is i mean was it in act 17 you worship the unknown god Paul says, yeah, you, you might know the unknown God, but let me tell you who that God is in person, in the Son. Yeah, exactly. And, and that is essentially how uh, the Reformed theologians have approached it. Now, I, I want to I wanna make a, another nuance here. Uh, sometimes when we read it that way, it comes out entirely negative, right? Okay, so the, the idea is, well, that's great, but all that natural theology is good for is making sure that I'm condemned. <laughs> I'm without excuse. It's not good for anything else. Well, that's not what the reformed, early Reformed theologians thought. You know, you jump into Vermigli, for example, and Vermigli will, will clearly say, no, the, the purpose, the origin, or the, 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 the reason why we're able to know something of God through nature is not primarily to condemn us. That's a side effect of how we react to that knowledge we can have of God in, in nature. The purpose of this divine revelation of the, of the, of the divine nature in creation is to draw people to God mm -hmm. in the same way that the inspired scriptures have that purpose. 
of revealing God. It's, it's to make uh, people come to know something of God. And in, that's why some of the early Reformed theologians, again, and some of the Puritans even, will talk about the, the natural uh, theology should bring us to worship the Creator. You know what's, uh, you just remind me, I was reading Romans recently. In chapter 10, Paul says, faith co- so faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Then here's the rhetorical question. But I ask, have they not heard? Then Paul answers, indeed they have, for, then he cites Psalm 19:4. their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the earth. What has? Well, that's through nature in yep. Psalm 19. Yeah, exactly. And um, so there's, there's a real revelatory, true, good thing that's happening. As you noted, though, it's us that kind of makes it bad for us because of our, our sin. One thing I wanted to say, too, this, I, 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 that came to this realization maybe last year or this year, that in this conversation... This almost never gets stated. When you have the Holy Spirit and your nature's renewed, natural knowledge is much better for you. And you can understand reality well. Yeah. Not saying that your sin nature, you know, the body, is, there's not a bit of a conflict there. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you think about natural theology, natural law, this kind of stuff, like natural law in terms of discerning what's right and wrong, what's purpose, yeah. virtue, all that kind of stuff. Like, once you have the Holy Spirit, you should be much better at that. And it's no longer to make you without, like, it no longer has the effect of making you without excuse, but rather deepens your appreciation of reality. What is, what is really real? Absolutely. That's what Stephen Charnock says. Uh, Stephen Charnock is going to talk about natural theology. And he says that one of the uses of natural theology is to prevent practical atheism uh, amongst believers. Practical mm-hmm. atheism being... I say that I believe that God exists. I say that I'm a Christian, but I'm not acting like I believe what I say. So I'm acting or living as if there is no God, even though I say there is. And so, but he says, no, having a, a, a decent understanding of what natural theology tells us about God actually helps prevent that. And it actually increases our worship. So, and, and I, would, I would also add in, one of the roles that natural theology has played in the development of Christian doctrine for theologians is that it has helped us to properly understand and interpret scriptures, right? So when you're reading, when you're reading the scriptures and it says uh, that God uh, is, gets, gets angry, you know, if, if, you, if you obey me, I will be happy with you. If, you. if you disobey me, I will become angry, right? Well, okay, so God's not impassable. He's passable. He can, he has changing emotions, right? That's not what Calvin would think. Uh, Calvin, on the contrary, would say, no, when we read that God is angry or happy, we have to understand that as an anthropopathism, right? This is something we're, we're applying to God emotions that God does not have in order to help us understand something this about God and about us. So God is impassable. And yet the scriptures seem to continually say and apply emotion to God. So how do we understand that? Natural theology helps us to understand that and interpret that. And so it provides this in a little tool for interpretation into our, uh, our tool belt of hermeneutics. You know, I'd, I'd even add something maybe even more direct than that. In the, la- in the last 150 years, I would say people who are involved in scriptural interpretation have appreciated the higher level of accuracy when it comes to some grammatical, linguistic growth. So people who love, you know, historical and grammatical exegesis appreciate all these kind of methods and, and, and keen in. But that actually helps them. That's natural knowledge, you know, grammar, syntax. Absolutely. You read these big books on Greek syntax in seminary. But actually, that helps you to read well scripture. It's not that scripture teaches you syntax. There's no like Greek syntax chapter. It's Wallace, <laughs> you know. And yep. that's natural knowledge that is great. Um, what you said is also there, but I think sometimes you can kind of, what I'm just saying is more like the very like super direct, very basic way of kind of putting it. Yep, yep exactly. Um, something that's massively important, they, they work together. Um, I, I don't want to go into this because I, I could talk for too long but i think it's really important like this has been normal in the christian tradition i think of gregory of nyssa and uh the reason that he sees that uh the six days of creation and that sequence is actually because it matches the sequence of the natural order for him scripture and nature that the aquabathia the sequence of both 
are not only not in conflict, but in fact correspond in deep, mutually interpretive ways. So and for him, it kind of goes down to the order of creation is like, is the plant life, to the bestial life, to the human life. And there's a hierarchy of sort of moving into the sixth day, which is the final day, the most important of God's creation, which is humans in his image. Um, I, I just find that it's su such a normal, regular belief that we have somehow maybe, maybe lost hold of. So let me ask you as we kind of um, run down the, the arc of this conversation for, for the podcast today. Uh, and this my answer is like, so why did you edit this book? Uh, I think it relates to things we're talking about, maybe reform Thomism a little bit, natural knowledge, the idea that we can appreciate it. But why is this book without excuse by the Davenant Press? Wh why is it published? That's a that's an interesting question. That's uh, kind of get into some biographical uh, details. Um, so the why it's there, it's in part because um, of my own uh, personal working through uh, of the reformed theologians of just kind of going through myself and reading these guys. Uh, it's, it's partially because of that. It's partially because uh, back in, I, it was it 2018, a book came out by, by Oliphant on Thomas Aquinas. And I read through that book and saw all of the same, same errors that Van Til made in relationship to historical exegesis of the Reformed theologians, uh, interpretation of the, of the early Greek the, uh, philosophers, uh, the early church fathers, and so on. And, and just the same things over and over again. And at some point I was like, it just crossed my mind, this is, we've got to somehow move this debate forward a little bit. So the idea of the book, and this might seem strange, the idea of the book is, was, was not, I don't think it still is, is not this intention to attack a position with the, with the purpose of you know, destroying it or, or wiping it off the face of the earth or anything like that. I, that's not the purpose of this book. The purpose is not polemical. Uh, the purpose is academic. The purpose is to a certain extent. The, the idea is... Uh, when I brought the authors on, I, I reached out to different people in who, who were doing, who were working in academia in areas related to their subjects, or who had written on it before, or who had presented on it before, and said, "Hey, look, I'd like you to look at this subject not so much with the purpose of attacking Van Til. Yes, it's going to interact with it. I want to correct the aim a little bit." So in French, there's this there's this saying. Uh, I'll say it in French, corriger la tire. It's, it's correcting, the, correcting the aim. So you, you do that in archery, right? When you have a compound bow, uh, you, have, you have these, these things on it which allow you, that allow you to line it up based upon distances. And, and you can move them back and forth based upon where your arrow hits to help you hit center. And the idea of this book is to kind of say, okay, in the current debate, Presuppositionalists are attacking classical theism on a number of issues, but they're attacking what, is, what are clearly straw men. They're hitting beside the mark. So I, what I want to do is I want to put out there, here's what they say. Here's what classical theists are really saying. Or at least, at least a, a decent summary of what some classical theists are saying. And so that's that's why there will be that's why there's a chapter in there on on realism, explaining this is this is what modern realism is saying. So if you're going to attack something, this is what you can attack. Uh, that's why there's a there's there's an article in there on the early reformed approach to Aristotle, the early reformed approach to Aquinas, because when you when you read some of the presuppositionalist arguments in relationship to these people. They're, they're totally off the mark. Uh, historically, the early reformed uh, church, uh, the early re reformers, I wouldn't go out and say, I, I, I would never go out and say they were all across the board reformed Thomists, okay? No, uh, at the end of the mid Middle Ages, there, there are four uh, basic schools of thought coming out of the Middle Ages. You've got the Okamists, the Scotists, the Albertists, uh, who, are, who are in relationship to uh, Albert the Great, or Albertus Magnus, and then there's the Thomists. And 
and you've got the early reform scholars interacting with these different schools of thought. Now, again, they've been changed, they've been modified from, you know, the original thoughts of Occam or the original thoughts of Scotus and the original thoughts of Aquinas that, that we're talking 200 years later, people were, were totally, two, two, totally different generations of thinkers, but these are the schools. And the reformed theologians did not find themselves in opposition to any of them, per, in per se. They're, they're going to pick and choose here and there. And so the idea was just to kind of say, okay, when the presuppositionalist author, for example, Oliphant, is attacking uh, Aquinas, he's saying certain things which are historically wrong. Here's the truth historically. Can we get back to a discussion that's helpful? That, that's kind of the, the idea with this, this book. It's, it's just to correct the aim, try and reorient the discussion so we're talking about the, 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 the things that are important in the discussion. Um, that's why there's an article on, transcendent, on the transcendental argument. Uh, this is often presented as the argument uh, that, is, that is Vantillian. And yet most philosophers are going to look at that transcendental argument and say, that's not new. That's been around for a really long time. And so that's the, that's the, that article is there to just kind of reorient the discussion again and say, look, this is not new with Van Til. Aristotle used this type of argument. Immanuel Kant used this type of argument. Look, C.S. Lewis could be, could, be, could be found using forms of transcendental argument. Okay, so this is not new with Van Til. So, so let's not debate this point. Let's, let's turn the debate where it will be helpful. And that's kind of the, the purpose of the book is to really, uh, my hopes anyways, is that it will be a help to the discussion to, to, to help the, uh, the, lay, the reader who's going, who's going to interact with it to better understand the discussion, uh, to realize, for example, as one of the conclusions from uh, uh, Thomas Schultz, Schultz's argument uh, in, his, in his article, to realize that you don't have to be presuppositionalist to be a reformed theologian. Uh, oftentimes in the debate, uh, presupposition, presuppositionalism is presented as if it was the biblical reformed the approach to theology and apologetics. It's not. It is a uh, slightly marginal approach to reformed apologetics. It is certainly not the approach to apologetics and to the relationship between theology and philosophy that we find in the early reformers from the 1500s to I'd even go so far as the 1800s. It is not the approach to natural knowledge, natural theology, natural law that we find in the Synod of Dort, nor in the Belgian Confession. Now, that should carry a lot of weight because that's two of the three uh, um, doc that documents that are important for, for orthodoxy. Yeah. It's also not the approach of the Westminster Confession or of the Westminster Catechism in the, in the larger catechism. And we know that from just not only from reading the catechism, we can know that from reading the, com the, the, the commentaries that were written on the catechism in the years following its publication. So this, these articles kind of help, I hope, reorient this, the discussion to say presuppositionalism is a position within the reformed, uh, within reformed theology, it's marginal. And if we're going to discuss it, let's concentrate on the main on the main issues. Well, that's helpful. And uh, I haven't finished the book, but I have been reading it. And that's one thing I, I've already appreciated, like uh, the way in which, you know, Van Til and others are treated is with, with there are fathers in the faith that came before us. We want to respect uh, them as authors and as faithful people. But here is why we disagree in these areas. And that, that's really from what I've seen, how the book is written. And think, I think that's incredibly helpful for a couple of reasons. One, because it's good. Um, two, I think sometimes if you're trying to disagree with someone, if you just keep pecking away at their argument, it never ends. Yeah. Rather, I think what you guys are doing, which is, which is quite well, is like, look, here is what the reformers said and did on these topics. Do with it with what you want, but this is what's really true. You, you may say, I disagree, fine. Or you might say, oh, actually, the, the disagreement's no longer there. Great, because it really... In my opinion, the guys who are presuppositional today, they really shouldn't 
have a huge disagreement with with us to be more classical there's there's really no <laughs> it, when, when you understand that, there's very little antagonism that needs to be there yeah. i think the presuppositional argument as such is fine okay something you can use it's not really my thing but i get it it's great uh all of us believe in the authority of the bible we're all reformed in terms of our historical identity and, and all that kind of stuff so i think sometimes these debates get so overblown and as you noted i mean i i kind of grew up in these the circle or not grew up i was educated in a a Ventilian circle. And uh, I'm just not sure. I think accuracy, historical accuracy is not really there. Um, or I don't know, yeah, I guess that's part of it. It just, it's like you said, you think this is the Bible's view, transcendentalism. It's not. It's, and as you noted, it's, it's a very, it's an odd kind of way to put things. And it's maybe a 1% of the whole picture type of thing. But I'm, I'm glad you guys are doing it. I think it's a helpful book, but overall the way that it's presented is here's what's true. Here's why it's true. Here's the evidence for why it's true. Now let's, instead of just fighting each other, let's think about the actual issues at hand. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that there are a lot of, uh, you know, great theologians out there uh, on both sides of this debate. And I, I find it a bit unfortunate. A lot of the, the, the way in which the polemics are handled as if we're enemies fighting each other and so we need to uh, be sarcastic we need to undermine the other person's credibility i i i honestly do not understand that approach to doing christian theology it seems to me that we're on the same side and we are trying to I'll put it this way do theology and philosophy to the glory of God. Mm. Um, so we should be working together, which means that the people who are, you know, adhering to the presuppositionist position, they're not my enemies. They are my allies. Now I disagree with them on something. So what am I going to do? I start attacking them. No, try and just say, look, this is where the disagreement is. Now, if we can't come to some understanding, at least we know where the disagreement lies. Let's work together for these other issues rather than attacking each other as if we were sworn enemies. No, I think you're exactly right. Of course. I think especially as our, our circles in some ways are decreasing in North America, that the polemics against one another is increasing and it, it makes no sense. It really doesn't. Um, no purpose for it, but I do think there is a need for a clear, articulated, historical theology like what you guys are doing and, and philosophy what you're doing here. So that's incredibly helpful. I'll um I'll try to put a link to this in the show notes for this podcast. I think that's pretty easy to do. I'm not sure how that'll work on Apple, but I'm sure you can just kind of figure it out. So David, thanks so much for talking to me about reform Thomism, natural knowledge, and this book. Do you have anything that you want to say at the very end, like another book coming out or just like a last way, maybe close the conversation or, or maybe you want to uh, talk about Davenant Hall or something like if you have a class coming up in that, anything that you want to say? Um, I, I could, I could probably say, say, say something just to close off, I guess. Um, you know, we were, we're talking about the religious atmosphere, for example, in North America right now. Uh, there are so many issues out there that are being debated and on which, uh, natural theology and natural law can't have something to say. They're helpful in the current climate. And if the, if the climate continues to grow more and more anti-Christian, natural theology and natural law will become more and more important in interacting with our surrounding society. But that's why these issues are not just side issues in theology and for the Christian person. They should be central. This is how we interact with people who do not believe the scriptures. Okay. Um, and so that's what we're doing with this book. That's what uh, Davenant Institute has been doing for some, to, for, to a certain extent, they've been proposing and pushing forward a lot of the theology coming out of the early reformers. Uh, I've been concentrating primarily on, on the subject of natural theology, natural law. I've got a course uh, for this, this fall that I'll be teaching on uh, beauty and how uh, natural beauty points towards the existence of a creator. And it's one of the arguments that uh, unfortunately is kind of forgotten 
people don't talk about it that much anymore. And yet, uh, you know, Francis Turton lists the argument from beauty among one of the arguments that he uses to demonstrate the existence of God. So it, it, we're going to be talking about that in the course on uh, beauty and uh, beauty beyond being at the Davenant Hall. Uh, and I and don't just look at my the course there. Uh, you know, Ryan Hurd's got a wonderful course that he's putting out on the, on doctrine of God, uh, looking at the Summa Theologia. So if you have if if, so, if someone's having uh, would like to better understand Aquinas's approach to the doctrine of God, they really need to jump in with Ryan Hurd on that course. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other courses that are being put out this fall. So the people definitely need to go check this out. Uh, it's it's a really great program that Davenant Hall is offering. And uh, I mean, I, I guess you know, I, this, is the, this is the issue that's kind of my um, battle horse. But for me, the, the, idea would, one, the idea of natural theology is almost less about, let's get into deep philosophical arguments and more about, hey, you want to go sit outside and watch the sunset and see how God has set up the divine fireworks. Let's go worship God together in nature that's what it's about for me and i think that's what natural theology does for, for christians it allows them to come to a greater appreciation of the god who created this beautiful world in which we live mm. well that's a good way to end thanks so much david for your time and uh we'll have to hang out in person once that is more or less possible <laughs> i mean technically <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. You know, but it's a little bit hard